Hello, it's Friday the 7th of March. You're tuned in to our 10am newscast coming to you from Arirang's news centre in Seoul. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. North Korea rejects South Korea's proposal to hold working level Red Cross talks on future inter-Korean reunions. Pyongyang is thought to be keen on holding higher level talks. The crisis in Ukraine continues to twist and turn. The leaders of the U.S. and Russia hold telephone talks as the pro-Moscow parliament in Crimea votes in favor of becoming part of Russia and proposes a referendum to rubber stamp that move in just nine days' time. Plus, as Korea continues to lobby diplomats at a U.N. human rights meeting in Geneva, Japan denies it plans to re-examine the testimonies of Korean women who were forced into sex slavery by the Japanese military during World War II. Now, the answer was a firm and resounding no. North Korea has said no to South Korea's proposal to hold working-level talks on staging additional reunions for families separated since the Korean War. Experts say Pyongyang wants to talk and talk about a variety of things, but wants to do so at a higher level. Hwang Sang-hee reports. North Korea on Thursday rejected South Korea's proposal for talks on resuming reunions for families separated by the Korean War. The response comes one day after Seoul offered to meet for Red Cross working level talks next Wednesday at the Truce Village of Panmunjom. In a statement, the North said a proper atmosphere had not been created to discuss the reunion issue. South Korea's unification ministry expressed its regrets and called on the North to reconsider. The issue of separated families is a task to be resolved between the two Koreas before anything else without being tied to any other issues. But the North did not completely slam the door on the South. It said important humanitarian issues like making the reunions a regular event should not be dealt with by Red Cross officials. Experts say Pyongyang may want to meet for high-level talks to discuss a number of matters, like resuming South Korean tours to North Korea's Mount Kimgang Resort. The two Koreas held their first reunion event for war-separated families in more than three years last month, in a move largely seen as the first step towards improving inter-Korean ties. But since then, tensions have soared following Pyongyang's string of short-range missile launches in protest against Seoul and Washington's ongoing annual joint military drills. The unification ministry said it's currently reviewing what steps to take next. But some experts don't expect the North to agree to talks until Seoul and Washington wrap up their joint military drills in April. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye has urged North Korea to end its nuclear weapons program so the two Koreas can revive economic cooperation projects and move towards peace and reunification on the peninsula. At a commissioning ceremony for graduating military cadets on Thursday, the South Korean president said the North needs to realize it cannot develop its nuclear capabilities and economy at the same time. President Park then said if Pyongyang takes sincere steps to denuclearize, Seoul and the international community could work towards helping North Korea develop. The president, on the other hand, did say the South Korean military should be ready at all times for any form of provocation from the North. The UN Security Council has extended a mandate for sanctions on North Korea for another 13 months, saying the regime remains a serious concern to international security. The Security Council said Thursday it extended until April 2015 the mandate for the panel of experts charged with assessing sanctions imposed for North Korea's nuclear arms program. The UN Security Council slapped tough sanctions on Pyongyang in response to nuclear tests in 2006 and 2009. The screw was turned even further in response to a, a missile test and a third nuclear test early last year. The UN's move comes amid a series of Scud missile and short-range projectile firings by the North in recent days. Now, if everything goes according to plan, Korea will have a leaner fighting force by the year 2022. The government proposed to cut 110,000 active 
personnel by then and focus more on the high-tech gadgetry that will dominate the battlefields of the future. Kim Yun bin reports. The number of mandatory active duty soldiers in Korea, currently 633,000 strong, will be smaller by 2022. The Defense Ministry said Thursday it plans to cut 40,000 troops over the next five years and 70,000 more between 2019 and 2022 for a total reduction of 110,000. To fill the gap, the number of non-commissioned officers would increase from the current 30 percent to 43 percent by 2025. To better prepare for the handoff of wartime operational control currently scheduled for 2015, the military plans to merge two of its three Army headquarters and set up a ground operations command. The initial merger date was set for 2030, but that's now been accelerated to 2026. In other plans, the Navy will set up a submarine command to counter the increasing underwater capabilities of the North, while the Marine Corps will establish a Jeju unit, an aviation group to defend Korea's southernmost island. With regard to the North's missile and nuclear threats, the Defense Ministry will also refocus efforts on developing the kill chain and Korea air and missile defense systems, which can detect and counter missiles and nuclear weapons from Pyongyang. The operation of target range of high-tech gadgetry, such as satellite-guided missiles and next-generation fighter jets, will also get a boost. Experts say all the changes are being made in consideration of the nation's low birth rate as the military attempts to transition into a more efficient and cheaper force. The military estimates that it will cost over 201 billion U.S. dollars over the next five years to implement the plan, which represents an average annual increase of 7.2 percent of the defense budget. Kim Bin, Arirang News. Korea's efforts overseas to pressure Japan to take responsibility for its past wrongdoings may be paying dividends. Japan has denied that it has plans to re-examine its official apology to the Korean victims for its military's forced recruitment of sex slaves during World War II. Tokyo is, however, sticking to its stance that the victims were compensated under a bilateral treaty signed in 1965. Connie Kim reports. Korea's fight for Japan to take responsibility and compensate the victims of its wartime sexual slavery rolled on in Geneva on Thursday. Korea's foreign minister had the floor and laid out a compelling and emotional case for the victims at the UN Human Rights Council meeting on Wednesday. But on Thursday, it was Tokyo's turn to put its points across. Japan's ambassador to the UN, Takashi Okada, said Tokyo, contrary to the reports, has never spoken of reviewing the 1993 Kono statement in which then Chief Cabinet Secretary Yohei Kono apologized to the victims of Japan's sex slavery. Since then, the position of the government of Japan has not changed at all. The government of Japan has never spoken of reviewing the Kono statement. Japan's current chief cabinet secretary, Yoshihide Suga, speaking in Tokyo Thursday, said that Prime Minister Shinzo Abe does not make light of the fact that Japanese actions caused immeasurable pain to the Korean woman, as recognized by previous governments. Late last month, there were reports Suga had said Tokyo would re-examine the testimony given by former sex slaves, as the government at the time did not verify the victim's remarks. Back in Geneva, Okada said the Japanese government had fully compensated the victims through a 1965 treaty that normalized Korea's economic and diplomatic relations after its liberation from Japan. On Wednesday, Korean Foreign Minister Yoon byung se had urged Japan to take responsibility and compensate the victims. Yu yeon chul Korea's ambassador to the UN, urged Japan to admit to and take responsibility for its military's past use of sex slaves. The political leaders and government officials of Japan have recently tried to deny the Kono Statement of 1993. South Korea wasn't alone in criticizing Tokyo for its past actions and current inaction. The North Korean and Chinese ambassadors to the UN said the Japanese government was trying to deny and hide its past wrongdoings. The U.S. ambassador to Japan, Carolyn Kennedy, on Thursday called on Korea and Japan to improve relations and said the U.S. will do what it can to help. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia and beyond. On air, on your mobile and online 
We lead the way every day. Arirang News. Now, on an, a day of fast-moving developments in Ukraine, U.S. President Barack Obama has urged his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, to seek a diplomatic situation to the crisis. The White House says that during the hour-long phone call Thursday, Obama urged Putin to hold direct talks with the new government in Ukraine. He also explained that Russia's violation of Ukraine's territorial integrity prompted the U.S. to take a number of punitive steps in response. This phone call came a matter of hours after the pro-Moscow parliament in Crimea voted in favour of becoming a part of Russia and proposed a referendum to rubber stamp that move in just nine days' time. Ukraine has called the decision illegitimate. Meanwhile, the European Union says it will consider sanctions on Russia if it doesn't de-escalate the situation quickly. Back here in Korea, and rival party lawmakers went head-to-head -head on Thursday, this time over revisions to the nation's pension system. The ruling party wants seniors to receive the new monthly stipend on a sliding scale, whereas the opposition party wants all qualifying seniors to get the same amount. Our National Assembly correspondent, Jim Young gil has this report. The ruling Saenuri party urged lawmakers to pass revisions to the pension system at a meeting of its Supreme Council at a community welfare center on Thursday. The parliament should act quickly to pass pending welfare bills that directly relate to improving people's livelihoods. We must make sure that there are no holes in the government's welfare programs. The party wants to link the so-called basic pension program to the National Pension Service. Under the basic pension program, senior citizens in the poorest 70 percent income bracket would be given a monthly pension of 90 to 190 U.S. dollars. Seniors who have paid into an NPS account for 11 years or less would receive the most, while those paying more than 11 years would receive less since they would also get NPS benefits. The main opposition Democratic Party is against linking the two programs. The government should provide a basic pension to all senior citizens ages 65 and older in the bottom 70 percent income bracket, regardless of how much they've put into their NPS accounts. Back at the National Assembly, lawmakers on the Welfare Committee discussed providing pensions to people with disabilities and giving allowances to people living under extreme conditions. Despite months of negotiations to find a middle ground, there have been no signs that the two parties will adjust their positions in order to strike a deal. In any case, the two parties hope to launch the new pension scheme in July. Kim young Arirang News. The Korean government has unveiled a set of measures to ease regulations that hamper corporate mergers and acquisitions. The move aimed at fostering startups is part of the government's three year economic innovation plan. Hwang Jie has the details. Late last month, Facebook bought the mobile messaging service WhatsApp for a whopping 19 billion US dollars. Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, described the five year old upstart company as an incredibly valuable service. The Korean government is now aiming to promote similar mergers and acquisitions that help venture startups promote their products to more people around the world. Finance Minister Hyun Suk said Thursday that the government will streamline tax and financial support systems to remove regulations that hinder corporate M&A activities. Hyun said the government expects the M&As to create a virtuous circle where venture startups can grow into global companies. The government will expand the size of a growth fund for the merger and acquisition activities of venture firms and small and medium-sized companies to around $930 million within the next three years. With the set of measures the government has laid out, a report by the Korea Institute of Finance says the nation's M&A market is expected to nearly double by 2017 to $65 billion from last year. To make that a reality, Hun urged M&A market participants like companies and investors to make good use of the measures. 
The finance ministry said the local M&A market has continued to shrink after the global financial crisis in 2007 and 2008, and that its size is smaller compared to other advanced economies. It added that a sluggish M&A market prevents the kind of voluntary business restructuring that allows companies to focus their investments on core areas. The measures to boost mergers and acquisitions are in line with the three-year economic innovation plan laid out by the Park Geun-hye administration that looks for new growth engines to strengthen the nation's economic fundamentals. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. And while we're speaking of creating an ecosystem for venture startups, the ministry in charge of science and technology announced some ambitious plans aimed at giving these fledgling companies a leg up. Na Hyung Young reports. Only 30% of the nation's startups survive to the age of five, according to recent statistics Korea data, which is one of the reasons why the government is trying to turn the tables for young entrepreneurs who are willing to test creative new ideas. The Ministry of Science, ICT and Future Planning has fleshed out its ambitious plan to launch what's widely known as an accelerator program. The Korean government's version of the program aims to help startups by providing a packaged service. A small group, fewer than 10, of wannabe entrepreneurs with creative and unique ideas will be selected in each round. They will be given three to six months of mentoring and training prior to opening up their businesses, and then they will have a chance to make pitches aimed at locking down investment. After the business is launched, these up-and-coming firms will be provided with marketing and retail networking services so they can break into the domestic market. Not only that, a selected few promising companies will get additional support in tapping into the global market. A total of 10 billion won, or roughly 9.4 million U.S. dollars, will be injected into this program this year. The ministry plans to form a special consultative body for the accelerator program by mid-March and has also called on conglomerates to launch similar programs to fund and nurture the nation's startups. Na Hyun Kyung, Arirang News. Now to the patent battle that refuses to go away, and it's good news for Samsung this time, as Apple's request for a permanent U.S. ban on Samsung's patent-infringing products has been denied. In her ruling Thursday, U.S. District Judge Lucy Coe said Apple had not presented enough evidence to show its patented features were a significant enough driver of consumer demand to warrant an injunction. This ruling comes ahead of another patent trial set to begin later this month involving newer Samsung phones and could negatively affect any further attempt by Apple to block the sales of those models as well. In a statement, Samsung said it was pleased with the ruling. Apple has yet to comment. Good day, I'm Eunice Kim, and here are your headlines from around the world. Five Afghan soldiers have been killed in an airstrike by NATO-led forces in Afghanistan's eastern province of Logar. Afghan officials say at least eight others were seriously wounded. The strike on friendly targets was accidental, coalition forces said, adding that they were mistaken for insurgents during the operation meant to support Afghan security forces. The affected soldiers have been moved to Kabul. Meanwhile, the Afghan government is calling for an investigation. And some good news out of the U.S. The number of Americans filing for unemployment benefits for the first time hit a three-month low last week. The U.S. Labor Department said the number of claims fell to their lowest level since November of last year to a seasonally adjusted 323,000. Analysts say the figures reflect a return to a more normal level consistent with healthy labor market conditions. Meanwhile, a government report on employment will be released on Friday, which is expected to show the impact the severe cold weather has had on jobs growth.
And staying with the U.S., two years and some billions of dollars. That's what Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Martin Dempsey said it could cost to right the damage done by Edward Snowden's intelligence leaks. General Dempsey made the estimations at a meeting of the House Armed Services Committee. He also reported a mitigation task force had been established to probe the depth of the damage as well as to devise a solution to the theft. Former NSA con contractor Edward Snowden faces espionage charges in the U.S. and is believed to be in Russia, where he has been given asylum. Over in Tunisia, the country's state of emergency effective since 2011 has been lifted. The announcement was made Thursday on President Monsef Marzouki's official Facebook page. Tunisia has been taken by political turmoil and violence since then leader Zain El Abidin Ben Ali was deposed at the start of 2011. The state of emergency was lifted early as it had been extended to June, though the government did add that law enforcement still had the option of seeking help from military forces where appropriate. And ahead of the International Women's Day on Saturday, the OECD has released a survey that examined how much, quote, unpaid work women and men in the 34 member nations pitched in around the House. Comparing statistics related to a number of minutes men and women contributed to doing chores, the report concluded working women were slowly closing the gap, though there is still a huge gender gap in unpaid work. It found that Norwegian men clocked in the most time contributing to household chores, while the men who contributed the least came from Japan. And TGI Friday, everyone, as we kick things off in the Ladies European Tour as world number one Pagin B went into the first round of the World Ladies Championship. Of course, coming off of a pretty good round last weekend, Pagin B has a great start, finishing off the first round of the World Ladies Championship, shooting a four under par, tied for fourth overall. Pagin B would keep pace throughout the 18 holes, but it was her rival Suzanne Pedersen who would storm through the first round, shooting a six under on the day, giving her the lead after the first round. Now moving over to football, for all you football fans in Korea, Saturday will mark the 31st season in the K-League Classic, and a lot can be expected in the new season. And what a treat for all the K-League Classic fans will get on Saturday when the new season kicks off, as the defending champions, Puang Steelers, will face off against the Ulsan Hyundai Tigers in a rematch of last season's dramatic final game, where Puang pulled away with a last-second goal to win the league title. And of course, even with Chumbo Hyundai Motors being the favorites to win this season's title, the title is up for grabs as many teams strengthen their team during the offseason. Well, many male fans in Korea had a day to forget on Thursday as the nation found out that figure queen Kim Hyun Ah is in love and dating someone. That confirmed by Kim Hyun Ah's agency All That Sports, Kim Hyun Ah is currently dating ice hockey player Kim Won Jung, who is 30 years old and currently playing for the military hockey team. Many say that they met when Kim was training at the Tenang National Training Center in 2012. Now, experts also say that while this news was known beforehand, the media prevented it from going out before the Olympics so that it wouldn't be a distraction to Kim Yana. And now moving over to some Thursday night's KBL action. The Chunju KCC Aegis pulled away with a 80-72 win over Anyang KGC with the Incheon Etilan Elephants taking on Goyang Orions on the same night. So, let's take a look at the highlights. Now, first quarter of the game, Incheon all over Goyang's defense, outscoring them 21-11 in the first before extending that lead to 41-21 going into halftime. Second half, the Orions change up their game as they start rallying in the second half, but with Charles Rhodes leading the way with 18 points and 10 rebounds, Incheon holds on to take this game 80 to 67. And now finishing things off in the V League, we had the Hyundai Capital Skywalkers take on Russian Cash Vespid. So let's take a look at the highlights. Now going into the game here, first set, Russian Cash in control thanks to Arpat Baroti's eight points as they take the first set. 29 to 27, but the Skywalkers who desperately need a win here turn it up a notch thanks to Leberman Algamez and his 39 points on the night as they take the next three sets, 25-21, 25-20, and 25-22 as they take this match three sets to one. 
And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great weekend, everyone, and see you guys again for your sports needs. Morning. Well, we are having another cold start to the day, and afternoon high in the entire nation should be similar to yesterday. And more sunshine is expected today. It's looking absolutely clear, and it should stay this sunny all day long. So it's cold, sunny, and dry Friday. Uh, dry weather watch has been expanded for most parts of the country. So it's important to stay hydrated and apply a good amount of moisturizer to keep skin soft. And as we can see, cold wave advisory is still in effect for the mountainous areas in Gangwon-do. Uh, but it will be warmer tomorrow. High temperatures will push to near seasonal average. So morning lows will be remaining on the cold side. So uh, let's stay bundled. And here are the readings for today. The afternoon high in Seoul will only rise to 5, while Daegu, Gwangju, Busan should all get up to 8 under lots of sunshine. Now for other regions, it looks like Jeju will climb up to 7. Daejeon will see a high of 8, while the top temperature on Mount Kungang will be cold at minus 4. Well, have a great day, everyone. And back to you, Mark, in the studio. Thank you very much, Gian. And that's all for now. We'll be back at noon Korea time. For all the latest news and developments, be sure to download our smartphone application. And you can also find our website at adilang.co.kr forward slash news.